Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you with us again. This is class number three in our uh, series, our workshop series on leadership. And uh, this is probably the most important class of all because it's it's about the, the title of the class is Spirituality of a Leader. And uh, in many ways, this is the sum of all things. This is the heart of it. This is the strength of it. This is the power of it. This is the source of where a godly person's leadership flows. It flows from their spirituality. And so this is an incredibly important class. And the truth is, it's it's honestly very hard to do this class in one class. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the things in the power leadership class. So I took a little bit off of the spirituality, but uh, I'm going to give kind of a broad picture of the spirituality of a leader and um, and I appreciate everybody watching this morning. I appreciate all of us trying to be the best leaders that we can be and grow and be our best for God. Let's go ahead and start out with a prayer and then we'll jump on in. Father God, thank you so much for loving us, calling us to be with you, allowing us to know you, even to calling us into a relationship of uh, father and son and father and daughter and family and being part of the unity of you and the son and the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for including us in what you are doing and using us, Father, to be a light to this world. Help us, God, in our skills to grow, in our strengths to maximize them. Help us, Father, to be the best that we can be so we can shine as brightly as we can. Father, we know the world is lost. We know the world's in trouble. And uh, Father, your people need to lead the way out. And that means uh, us stepping up, God. Help us to grow and be our best for you. Learn as much as we can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so spirituality of a leader, um, it's at the heart of the call of God. You know, in 2 Timothy 1, 6, 9, he says, for this, very, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. You know, we all have gifts. We all have skills. We all have talents. And we've talked about that in the previous class and things that God gave us so that we can make a difference, so that we can help people, so that we can, you know, be a light in this world. All of us have those things, but but we have to fan them into flame. We have to we have to really make the most of them. And the first step is just being aware of what are my gifts, what are my strengths. We talked about that last week. By now, you should know exactly. You should be able to say, I'm good at this, 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 and this, and here's what I bring to the table. And I'm learning this, this, and this. And, and in these things, I'm going to get help and surround myself with great people. So we should know that. That's part of humility. That's part of being living by the truth. That's part of walking with God. And he says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Like get that, get that flame going. You know, if you've ever lit a fire, uh, you ever lit a campfire or the fireplace, you know that you start out little, and as soon as it starts to burn, you give it a little more oxygen and boom, it goes. And that's what we're, he's talking about. He says, for the spirit God gave us, he says, um, he says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. I mean, you want to talk about three things that we all want, right? That we all want to be our best in, is we all want to have the power of an indestructible life. We all want to be able to just flow from love and be rich in love and be able to have self-discipline in our life so that we can get the most done and be the best version of ourselves and all that good stuff. Well, that's what he says. This is the spirit of God. This is what it gives us. So, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or be his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us into a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. You know, he, he invites us to, to suffer with him. And, you know, I, I've said since the beginning that one of the definitions of leadership is being the person Who's willing to suffer more? Who's willing to suffer most? Who's willing to be the first one to suffer? Who's willing to be the last one to suffer? Who's willing to suffer the longest? I mean, that in an essence is at the heart of leadership is you're willing to lay down your life for others. You're willing to endure more pain for others. And it's what glorifies God. It's what makes the kingdom so incredible that people are willing to go through a lot to be their best and to serve God in great ways. And that's at the heart of it. And he says, he saved us and called us to a holy life, to a life set apart. You know, this is, this is so incredibly important because, you know, most of the world looks at being a Christian as just, oh, you belong to a church 
or you go to a church or you ascribe to a church or you have a set of beliefs. Now, this is much, the calling of God is much bigger than that. It's a holy life. It's a way of living that is distinct, that is different, that is special, that is full of power, that is full of, 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 of the light of the world, that is just, it's so different than where the, where the rest of the world lives. And as leaders, we not only set an example of this, but we're calling others to follow in this, this holy life that we live, not because of anything we have done, not because we're awesome or we're great, but because God has a purpose and for us, that he's something he's calling us to and, and wait, don't worry, don't let that pressure you because he also has a lot of grace. And that's what he says. So we strive to be our best as leaders for God, not for the world, not for fame, not for money, not for, not for vanity purposes, but for God, we're willing to suffer. We're willing to do God's will. And, and, and we know that we're never going to be perfect. We're never going to get everything right and do everything right. We strive for that and not to worry because God's rage, God's grace is rich and his mercy is, is, is without ending. And that's, that's God. That's what leadership is. It's saying, okay, God, here am I. Send me. I'm in. Work harder. Suffer more. I'm in, God, because I am grateful, because you have loved me, because I have more than I deserve. So here I am, Lord, send me. So that's leadership. Um, a leader's soul care. This is incredibly important. You know, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, this is a Bernard of Clairvaux, which I'm sorry, I didn't put the, I just realized I didn't put his name on there. He once said, he was, this is a, a monk who, really made an, a lot of incredible discoveries about spirituality, about walking with God, was a great thinker, was an incredibly spiritual man. Um, uh, he, says, he said once, he has many, there are many quotes, that he had a lot of good quotes, but uh, this is one of my favorites. Says, the man who is wise, therefore, will see his life as more like a reservoir than a canal. The canal simultaneously pours out what it receives. The reservoir retains the water till it is filled, then discharges the overflow without loss to itself. Today, there are many in the church who act like canals. The reservoirs are far too rare. You too must learn to await this fullness before pouring out your gifts. Do not try to be more generous than God. And that's, that's, that's an incredibly important point. Don't try to be more generous than God. I, and, and, and then you might hear that and think, well, that was stupid. Who would try to outgive God? But that's exactly what we're doing when we're out giving and serving and giving and serving, and we're not getting filled back up with God. When we're not letting Him give to us, Him fill us up, and, and we're just out there doing our thing. And usually, honestly, that's usually a sign of the wrong motives. That's usually a sign that we're either caught up in the vanity of it all or the self-importance of it all, or we become addicted to being the hero or the self-proclaimed Messiah of the church or the savior of everybody. And we're just give, 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 give. And we're not taking care of ourselves. If we understand God and we understand how this works and that we are just an instrument of God, then we understand that we don't do this without God. We fill up with God and then we give. And then we go back and fill up. And I'm not saying that that comes from a bad heart. That often comes from a, a great heart. But it's the mistakes of a great heart. Of not understanding that I'm doing this for God. And I need to fill back up. Else I'll run on empty. I won't be my best. And I'll mess up in ways that I don't want to be messing up. And as leaders, you know, this is the thing is, is you don't want to be messing up. Because when a leader messes up, it affects lots of people. So as leaders, we want to be full of God and rich in his grace. And, you know, sometimes people are not so rich in grace and they'll come after you and they'll hurt your feelings and stuff. That's why you've got to be rich in God's grace and, and, and confident in God so that when people aren't nice, it's OK. God is nice. And God takes care of you. But we've got to be constantly refilling. So we're not running on empty. So we're not giving more than we've been given and, and we're staying full of God. This is incredibly important. You know, the motives, there are those who seek knowledge. This is another great quote. There are those who seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge. That is curiosity. 
There are those who seek knowledge to be known by others. That is vanity. There are those who seek knowledge in order to serve. That is love. That's the heart behind all of this. That's the heart behind this. What we're doing right here, right now, is we're trying to learn our best, not so that we could be the best, not so that we can be everybody's hero, not so that we can outshine everyone else, but because we love God and we want to serve our people, our friends, our family, our neighbors, our, our Bible talk, our prayer partners, our discipling partners. We want to be our best for them. Why? Because Jesus was his best for us, right? God is his best for us and God blesses us. So we want to bless back. And so that's why we strive to learn more. Now you could say, well, okay, what if my motives are bad? What if I love the fame? What if I love everybody saying, Ooh, you're awesome. You did great. You did wonderful. You know what? Everybody does. Okay. That I'm not, none of us are that pure hearted that we don't, we don't have that struggle that we enjoy being the hero. We enjoy doing something and everybody's saying, Ooh, great job. We, we, it's just, it's us. That's, it's our human nature. What you don't do is you just don't give into that. And you keep going to God, thanking him, praising God. I'll tell you two tricks to keep your heart right. (laughs) One is praise God as much as you can. Two is confess your sins regularly. That keeps your head in the sky looking at God and your feet on the ground being well aware of your sins. So you don't get deceived in thinking that you become the savior. You're so awesome. You know, and, and you may laugh, but that happens to leaders. So we want to keep our motives pure as they can be. They're never going to be 100% pure. Some of us, I must admit, are more pure hearted than others. My wife is incredibly pure hearted. I mean, she just loves people, loves God, and she just does, you know. And, and, and she doesn't like anything fake, doesn't like any of these other stuff that messes with leaders. But, but I'll get tempted and, and I'll think things and I got to get my heart right. I got to work it out with God. I got to be open about my sins. I got to be praising God constantly. Makes it real clear. I am just an instrument. That's it. But I got to keep myself there. So that's why it's important that we're, we're praising God and we're being open about sins. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and here's the other thing. This is the real power. We're going to have a whole class on this, but I'll just say it now because it's part of the, the introduction is part of the understanding here is that leadership, you know, you, you can lead many different ways and, and there's all kinds of styles of leadership. And maybe in another series, we'll be able to go through different styles of leadership because it takes a while, um, to just even learn different styles. But, but what is most important in our leadership is that our leadership is powered by God. It's not powered by us. And, what, and, and there's, a, there's a saying that's kind of been a buzz saying, so to speak, in the last few years, is to have your ministry sales, not oars. Meaning that you can be a ship that is powered by rowers, by people pulling those oars and everybody's working hard and somebody's beating the drum and somebody's cracking the whip and and the ship can go well. But man, that's a lot of work. And to be honest, that's not really a lot of fun. It's a whole lot of work and it gets old really fast. Or you can be a ship that has all these sails up and is powered by the wind. And that ship's going to go much faster, much farther on a whole lot ener- less energy from you. And that's really what we're after, where we're, um, we're leaders empowered by God, not by our self-discipline, not just by our self-denial, not just by our incredible intelligence or our wonderful gifts, but powered by God. That's a whole nother level of leadership. That's a whole nother level of directing people. Uh, and, and, you know, Michelle and I have had a lot of success in the ministry. We've had our hard times. We've, we've had our hard knocks and learned our rough lessons, but we've been blessed a lot. And, and usually when things go really incredible, everybody wants to know, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? And the honest answer every time has always been, God did it. You know, we went to Puerto Rico and the church was struggling for, for years. It was struggling, not growing. And then boom, it exploded. It grew. It was, it was awesome. It was amazing. And, and, and people, how'd you do that, bro? How'd you do it? God did it, really. 
We went to New Jersey and we were given this little ministry and it exploded and became a strong, powerful ministry leading the way in, in the church. It was a wonderful ministry doing great things and lots of miracles and campus ministry was baptizing like crazy and amazing people and all this just incredible stuff was happening. People, how'd you do it, bro? What did you do? And, you know, I mean, I've got my, okay, we did this, 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 this. But at the end, at the end of the day, the truth is, it was God who did it. And, and that's not just a little phrase to, well, I want to give God the credit, even though I did all these things. No, it's really the truth. What Michelle and I figured out is that if you can get everybody connected to God, then all you're doing is steering them and pointing them the way. And God's empowering it. He's moving it. And it's way better for God to be filling those sails just blasting that ship forward, then all your skill, talent, experience, education, training, put together and rowing as hard as you can. It's just way better for God to do it. That's what turned around San Diego. That's what turned around Hope Worldwide. And I see it happening right now where I'm at now, here, right here in Metro, where as we get more and more connected to God, we're getting stronger and stronger. So the key to leadership is sales, not oars. And you know, we've all been there where we work so hard and so little happens. That's usually a sign that you're rowing really hard and bless your heart, you're working so hard and you're rowing so hard and not a whole lot is happening versus putting up those sails and you still gotta work hard. I mean, somebody's still gotta be putting those sails up, taking them down, swabbing the deck and doing all that hearty, har har stuff that sailors do. But it's God who's moving it forward. And so it's things are in the right place. Everybody works hard, but God is moving it forward. I'm not saying we're all sitting around getting suntans, drinking margaritas and watching God move the ship. We all have to work and we do, but it's so much better when God is moving it. So it's the spirituality of a leader that allows that to happen, that allows God to move powerfully that unleashes the Holy Spirit in your life and in the ministry. It's, 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 it's that level of spirituality that gets us through the tough times, that gets us through the difficulties, that, that yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, I fear no evil, for your rod and your staff are with me. It's that level of spirituality. It's, it's the spirituality that gets us through the times. There are times that I have laid on the floor face down and cried out to God because things were so hard. And I mean cried out to God. But it was that time with God that fortified, strengthened me so I could get through it and become a better person, a better leader, a better instrument of God. You know, there, there's uh, the classic, classic, classic um, uh, uh, illustration, you, you, you've probably heard it of the, 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 the iron, the, the, the metal worker who's pounding on the metal and he's pounding, pounding, pounding on the silver. And the, somebody walks up and says, how do you know when the silver's ready? Cause he kept putting it in the fire, bringing it out, pounding on it, put it back in the fire, bring it out, pound on it, put it back in the fire. And they said, how do you know when it's ready? And he said, when I can see myself in it, then it's ready. And that's the way God is with us. When he can see, when we can see God in us, then we're ready. Meanwhile, he's going to keep pounding on us. He's going to keep purifying us. He's going to keep causing us to grow. And I, I don't know what it is, but I, I think some of this is just where the world is going. The world is so afraid of suffering. I mean, we, we, you know, we, we want a pill for everything. There's got to be a pill for this. Give me a prescription for this. We think that any kind of suffering is bad and there better be a pill for it. A pill that will act with, will work within 10, 15 minutes and relieve us of all suffering. Suffering, unfortunately, is a necessary part of growth. It's a necessary part of maturity. Even Jesus was made perfect through suffering, Hebrews chapter 2. Even Jesus was made the perfect Savior through what he suffered. So there's no shortcuts on this. It's a good thing. But it's spirituality that takes that pounding and that being on the anvil and turns it into gold, turns it into something beautiful. 
You know, we, we, we know the scriptures tell us that if we keep adding to our faith, goodness and knowledge and to knowledge it, that it keeps us from being ineffective and unproductive. Right. So we have to keep growing. We keep advancing and growth is suffering. What the opposite of that is we learn a bunch of stuff, get set in our ways and we won't change and we don't grow anymore. And we, and we become this person that is basically does everything the same way they have for the last 30 years you know, or the last 20 years. And that's got nothing to do with age. Man, there's some people that are old and crusty and they're only 28 years old, you know, or they're old and crusty and they're only 40, you know. And then there's some people that are, you know, old and crusty age and in culture, you know. And we don't want to be that because Jesus warns us, you know, you don't put, you don't sew a new piece of cloth onto an old blanket. You don't sew, you don't fill wine, new, pour new wine into an old wine skin. It will crack, it will fall apart, it won't make it. You know, what I always say when somebody says, don't be, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I say, don't be an old dog, be a new dog. It's all in the mind, it's all in the heart that we're still growing, we're still learning. Spirituality should never stop growth. We should never stop growing. I mean, the truth is, I, I honestly, I've learned more about God in my walk with God in the last 10 years than I had in the previous 25 years of being a Christian. In the last five years, in the last six months, my relationship with God just keeps getting more and more dynamic. And sometimes it's like, man, and I don't mean like every day I wake up and woohoo, me and God have this rocking time. But every week I'm learning more and I have, every week I have these moments that are just like, ah, oh, wow, look at this, you know? And, and, and then I have the flat days, you know? It's just like any relationship where you kind of get bored and staring at each other like, now what are we talking about? But, but then there's other days that it's just, it's full of discovery. It's full of excitingly new things. And that's what you need. That's what a leader's, everything depends on your spirituality as a leader. You cannot fake this. And the, and the challenge is that a lot of people get pulled into leadership because they clearly have the gift of leadership or because they're leaders in something, in sports, in education, at work. They're just super talented they're super good looking or they just, they're just super athletic or be, there's different reasons people get pulled into leadership and then they, they're in the crucible. Then they're on the anvil and, and we find out really whether they can be a spiritual leader. That is a much higher form of leadership than anything in the world. I remember I used to have this clip that I cut out, Lee Iacocca, one of the great captains of industry, one of the great CEOs of America. He turned around companies, made millions of dollars. And I had this article because he said, in the article, he said, you know, I can turn around a business easy. I can make lots of money, no problem. I just wish I knew how to run a marriage and a family. <laughs> That only comes from spiritual leadership. That only comes from God. So spirituality, it's everything. And in a leader in the church, it's incredibly, incredibly important. And the tricky part is sometimes it's not so obvious. So what does that mean, the spirituality of a leader? Well, there are disciplines of spirituality. There are, there are facets of spirituality that we're talking about here. Prayer, scripture reading, fasting, meditation, balance, mindfulness, contemplation, confession, silence, worship, singing. These are all elements of our spirituality, of how we're doing. Some of these we've been taught a lot. Some of these very little, some of them not at all. And I hope we, we will grow as a leadership group in all these areas. And I know some of these areas are brand new to you because they're brand new to me. I'm just learning. I've just been learning about mindfulness and contemplation in the last six to eight months, you know, and, and it's been awesome. I mean, it's added whole new dimensions to my walk with God. And I know that some of you have been out there experimenting and learning this kind of stuff already, but a lot of us have never have done that. We're like, I thought that's what Buddhists did or what you do at yoga. No, you actually do that in the church and you actually do that. And, and the church, early church, early Christians did this stuff all the time. That was part of their faith. 
and the church did for really the first thousand years. It wasn't until modern times that some of these things faded out and were gone. And in a lot of ways, Christianity is rediscovering these things like mindfulness and contemplation and meditation and things like that. Um, pr- prayer. We'll just start with prayer. And again, I don't have, I mean, as you, you're well aware, every one of these topics could be a class in itself. So we're just hitting it in regard to the importance of a leader, right? Psalm 139, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offense way, offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, this, this is a beautiful prayer about just how we are with God. You know, that, that we, we, we should be completely open with God, completely honest with God. We should give Him our heart. We should not let our relationship with God be anything but fantastic. That we just, we need that. That is our source of energy, strength, wisdom, guidance. It's, 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 it's how we can stay connected, be aware of the Holy Spirit, be aware of what God's telling us. It's, it's so, you know, when I pray, I always have a pad of paper with me or, or my journal or something to be able to write with whenever I have a prayer time. Now I'll pray throughout the day and, 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 you know, I mean, even my, my, my other watch, not this one, but my other watch, uh, it alar- sends an alarm three times a day to remind me to pray because Frankly, I don't have enough time in the morning to pray for everything that I want to pray about. And, and I try to just get down through my list little by little. But, but I know this, that, that the key to being spiritually healthy is my prayer life. It's your prayer life. You cannot be a strong and spiritual leader without a great prayer life. This is your connection to God. This is, this is where you plug in. This is where, and, and, and it's gotta be great. It means you, you've gotta be at a place where you can just focus on God. You know, yeah, on the way to work, praying, driving. Yeah, sure. That's great. Going for a walk, prayer. That's awesome. You know, doing different stuff. But what, what the key is, it's gotta be in a way that it's just you and God and you're able to talk to God. It can't even be just sitting there thinking it in your head because a lot of us, the truth is, for many of us, it's very hard to even get focused. We start praying in our head. The next thing you know, we're figuring out what we're doing at two o'clock and what we're going to eat for dinner and what, you know, when, what, what laundry I need to get started. And we had all these other thoughts coming into our brain. And it's like any conversation, like, like this afternoon, I'm typing on top way and Michelle said, Oh, can I ask you something? And I said, yeah. And I'm typing away. And she said, are you done? Are you finished? And I realized She just asked me for her attention to talk to me. I can't be doing something else. I remember a very vivid moment, a moment that I'll never forget my whole life. I was working on the computer and I was working on something. And I hear my son at that point, he was probably about five or six. He was like, dad, dad. And I'm like, what, what, dad, what? And then he reached up his little hands and he grabbed my face and he turned me around. And I was so convicted. We need to give her the attention we need to God. We need to pay attention to God. So whatever, however we're doing it, as long as it works, as long as you're able to connect, you're able to get focused, you're able to, to get time with him. And sometimes when I'm really scatterbrained, you know, when a lot's going on or, or something's really troubling you and you have such a hard time to, to focus, I'll write my prayer instead. I'll just write, I'll write a letter to God. And that's my prayer. For, for some reason, I can focus when I'm writing it down. I can focus and I can even, you know, choose my words more carefully, stop for a minute and think, okay, what else do I want to tell God? And my prayer can be a letter. Or sometimes I'll pray, th- pray through the Psalms. I have a list of Psalms that are great to pray through. But the key thing is this, is that your relationship with God, the strength of it, the power of it comes from your prayer life. You've got to have a great prayer life. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And it's the thing that people rarely ask you about. It's one of those things that most of the time it's between you and God. And only God knows. But God does know whether he's secondary, tertiary, or even fourth in your life. Or he's first in your life. As a leader, I will give you this warning. If you don't have a good prayer life, you won't last long. You'll slip into sin. Or you'll get burned out. 
excel. Let God work powerfully through you. Be plugged in. My wife got me last Christmas this. I love, I, I love making my own lemonade, my own orange juice. So I buy bags of oranges, bags of lemons, and, and I just make all my own juice. And I had this little dinky juicer, you know, a little, little $15 one from Target or something. And for Christmas, she bought me this really nice one and really big one. It's beautiful. It's, it's like fiery red and chrome. It looks like a 57 Chevy. It's really cool, antique looking. And it's really cool. I was so excited. And I'm cutting the lemons. And I put the lemon on there. And nothing happened. You want to know why? I forgot to plug it in. I plugged it in. Man, squeezed out all the juice like that. Okay? If we're not plugged in, nothing happens. No matter how shiny we are, no matter how pretty we are, no matter how smart we are, no matter how talented we are, nothing happens. So remember that. We need God. Scripture reading. Psalm 119, 105. The word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. What a, what a great scripture. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Just, it just shows me the way. It just tells me what to do. And we all need that. We all need direction. We all need, I mean, I think about what we've been going through the last few weeks from the virus and, and then with all the stuff on, 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 with Ahmad's death and George Floyd's death and so many others. And it's brought up so many emotions from the past. We, we all need God. We all need to have that connection. We all need the scriptures to help us process this and work this through and, 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 you know, in different ways. And that's the cool thing about the Bible is, is the Bible has a, a million lessons in it. And it has a way of always knowing the right one for us. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. You know, the, 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 the thing about the Bible is, is you know, you, in reality, we don't have time to be great at many things. There's just, we have to, we have to decide in life, what am I really going to be good at? And what am I not going to be good at? I have the challenge. I have lots of interests and lots of things that I just love. But the one of the things that I've decided is I am going to be a person who really knows his Bible, who really knows it. And I think that to a degree, every Christian has to make that decision at some point in their life that I may not know a lot of things, but I will know the Bible. And, and, and I'm not saying everybody's got to learn Greek and Hebrew. And all. No, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I think, I think somebody in every church should be able to know Greek and Hebrew in case people try to introduce false doctrines or, or try to interpret the scriptures wrong. But for most of us, we just really need to know our Bibles. And we need to have a set of scriptures that we can rely on, that we can, when we're down, we can go to and read. When we're not sure what to do, we know how to find the scriptures that we need. That we have these scriptures that, 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 that we can share with others. When somebody's struggling with purity, when somebody's struggling with depression, when somebody's in a conflict, when, when somebody's angry, when somebody's hurt, we know scriptures. We have our go-to scriptures. And we not only have our go-to scriptures, but we're constantly learning new ones. We know how to correctly handle the Bible. And we let the scriptures speak. And this is really important for us leaders. We preach the Bible. We have to teach the Bible. We have to let the Bible speak. We can't use the Bible to back up what we want to say. That's a very easy thing to do. You know how you know you're doing that? When you think of all these things you want to say, and then you go look for a scripture to, to prove what you said was true. That means you're using the Bible to back you up instead of backing up the scriptures. When we have a problem, when we're going to teach a lesson, when we're going to share with somebody, when we're going to help with somebody, the first thing we should think of is what scriptures apply to this situation. We should, everything that comes out of our mouth should either be said in a scripture or guided by a scripture, but somehow tethered to a scripture. And we ought to be able to say, if somebody says, well, why, do, why, why would you say that? We ought to be able to say, well, because in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says this. 
you know, or because, well, I'll show you, even if you don't know exactly where it says that, but you know that it's there and you can find it when you need to find it. And that's, that's correctly handling the scriptures. This is what keeps, keeps us on point, keeps us on track and helps us not to wander off. He says, um, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. You know, there's something about knowing your Bible that just gives you an inner confidence. You know, that you just, I, I know my Bible. If somebody went at work or somebody at school or somebody knocks on the door and wants to argue scripture, I'm confident. I can handle it because I know my Bible. And, and somebody says some wacky stuff on TV or, or I'm reading a book, it says some weird things. I can check it because I know my Bible because I'm guided along. As we get older and as, we're, as we lead longer, here, here's really important as leaders. And all of this is as leaders and keeping in mind that all of us lead in different levels and in different ways. So in a sense, if you're listening to this, you are a leader. And you should assume you're a leader. You are either leading now or you're going to lead soon. But you're a leader. Everything we teach needs to be from the Lord, from God. And how we make sure that happens is by making sure we're teaching the Bible. That the Bible is guiding us along and helping us to know what to say and how to say it. And it will be much more powerful. It will be much more impacting, transformative. You know, when every time somebody becomes a Christian, part of the reason we're so happy for them, you know, when they get baptized and everybody's so happy, is because they have been transformed. They have been changed, right? And it didn't just all of a sudden instantly happen in the, in the baptistry. There are spiritual changes that happen there that we're also excited about. But we, what people share is how they've seen that person transform, how they've seen that person change. Right, All of us did that when we became Christians, or, or you and I need to sit down and talk if you didn't. But, but all of us went through this transformation process. It wasn't the person studying with us that transformed us. It was the Word of God. There is something very powerful about the Bible. Something very spiritual, if you will, about how the Bible works in our minds and in our hearts. You have to trust that. The very word of God has its own power. It has its own power to change hearts, to change minds. Just reading the scriptures is powerful. So remember that. When you open your Bible, you are turning on the power there, and you are unleashing it whenever you read it for yourself and for your hearers. Fasting, Ezra 8, 21, there by Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possession. You know, the Bible's full of great examples of when we really want to show our hearts to God, that we make a personal sacrifice, food, something that dominates every day of our life, many decisions we make. And, and it's so important to us that we are willing to go without. We are willing to make that sacrifice to draw attention to something very much on our hearts. And it's good for us. There's something about fasting. Some of the best prayers I've had was while I was fasting. You know that. That's happened to you probably. Um, and we just need to keep doing it regularly. It shouldn't become a thing of the past. Jesus said, when you fast, as in we should regularly fast. Meditation, Joshua 1.8. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. You know, one of the mistakes we make is we think that we learn by volume. Oh, I read a whole chapter today. That's great and, and, and that's okay. But sometimes you need just to read a paragraph and think about that paragraph for a while. Sometimes we need to read something and just stop and think about that and think about how it applies to me, how it applies to my life. What does it mean for me? How do I put this into practice? What are the implications of it? What must change because of this? And, and you know, again, I always, I describe it as 
two analogies I always use is unpacking the scriptures because every chapter is like a treasure box. There's all these really cool things in there. And if you just open it up, look at it, and then toss it aside and open up the next one, you're going to miss all kinds of incredible stuff there. You have to meditate. That's how you squeeze it. The other analogy is juicing. You know, I want every drop out of that. And I mean, I'm going through John now. We're going to finish the, the, our study of John. I'm getting so much out of it. And this is like the fifth or sixth or seventh time I've done the Gospel of John. I was just talking to Turner. Well, I've, I've, I've probably spent 60, 70, 80 hours or more studying the book of John. For me to get ready for that class, it only takes a couple hours because I've got all this back study in it. And I got tons of notes and thoughts and everything. And I, every time I'm learning new things, this, this time that I've been going through it in the devotionals, I'm learning all kinds of cool stuff. The scripture right before it ba- for balance. And you say, what is balance? What does that got to do with, with spirituality? You know, we get off kiltered. We have to remember that we look at life through a lens that includes our experience, all the influences we've had. As we're all, you know, most of us listening here, not everybody, but a lot of us listening are Americans. We live in the Western world. We have our upbringing. A bunch of us are Californians. We have this culture. We have a way of looking at things and a way of interpreting things. And sometimes that way can go off. And, and then we have our, our, our own personal things. Some of us are more, lean more conservatively. Some of us lean more liberally. Some of us are open-minded. Some of us are more traditional closed-minded. Some of us are more disciplinarians. Some of us are more, you know, just hug them. They'll be fine, you know, and, and, and those things affect us and cause us to lean to the right or to the left. So John, so God told Joshua in chapter one, verse seven, keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So we meditate on it so that we're not off track. We don't get thrown off. Actually, uh, I think I was supposed to get the scripture before it, but, but anyways, um, it, I can't remember if it's the scripture before it or, or the after. It talks about not going, it will keep us from going to the left or to the right. You know, it keeps us balanced. And that neither left nor right shows up in a number of places in the scriptures because God knows us that we tend to lean to the left or we tend to lean to the right. So we got to keep that balance. Uh, contemplation. You know, we, we at, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. You know, contemplating, this is a contemplative life, means that you take the time to just stop and think about what's happening, to think about what you're learning. What is God teaching me right now? What is God showing me? If you don't have a time to do that, you won't do it. We won't do it. And we just go through life and, and you know, we look back sometimes and, wow, that just was a blur. Why didn't I do this? Or why didn't I do that? Or why didn't I see the need there? Or why didn't... And we miss out on important things. Contemplative, living contemplatively means taking time, setting time aside where we just think about what God is doing. It's very similar to meditating. They go hand in hand. But this is more looking at what God is showing me and and where am I at with this and how am I doing with this? Whereas meditative is more thinking about the scripture Contemplative is thinking more about how that scripture applies to me in my situation or something else God is doing that's very evident that it's him. Confession. Um, You guys have all heard classes on confession. James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It's interesting how confession and prayer go together. Healing and confession go together. You know, we, we, we... Confession keeps our feet on the ground, like I talked about earlier, so we don't get deceived about who we are and what we are and how great we are or how much we need God. But it also helps us get out what's in our hearts and helps us to be healed. 
It helps us even, there's something about even sharing your hurts. You know, we're going through some pretty intense times right now where there's a dialogue that has been needed that we're having about race relations. And, and we had a meeting last Sunday where a lot of people got to be able to share how they've been hurt. That all that, all that is healing process, getting out the junk, the garbage that, that, that life has dished out to us and the hurt and the wounds. And, and, and so even, even just living an open life is so much more healing than guarding everything in our heart and not talking about what's going on inside. Silence. You say silence. That's a funny one. Zephaniah 1 7, be silent before the sovereign Lord for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated those he has invited. You know, part of being, being, uh, practicing meditation and contemplation, be contemplative in life, having a time set aside is just being silent and reading scripture and just letting God talk to you, letting the Holy Spirit speak to you and just listening, not saying, not asking, not telling, just being silent. I mean, this is a, this is a, a very helpful exercise, a tradition that has thousands of years of history. Um, in a lot of the monasteries, they would have silent hours. They would have, or they'd be silent all day. And they, and sometimes, sometimes they even were silent for weeks, you know, but, but there's something about you quieting all the noise of the world and the noise in my head. And, and it's honestly, it's a discipline you work up to. If you try it immediately, you got a thousand voices in your head, you know, and your thoughts and this and that and this. It's a discipline we, where we learn to quiet ourselves and we learn to, to, to calm ourselves and to focus on God and just listen. And there's a whole boatload of teachings about listening. Of course, worship is incredibly important. Uh, Psalm 29, 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Psalm 95, 6, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. You know, and, and worship is not just, it's not what you do at church. It is one of the things we do at church. But worship is something that we do all the time, that we should be doing seven days a week. We should get up in the morning and worship God. We should worship God throughout the day. We should, you know, and by the way, the word for worship is literally to bow down and prostrate yourself. It's, 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 which is kind of ironic because most of the time what we call worship, nobody's doing that. Everybody's standing up the opposite and singing, which is good. But actual word for worship is to prostrate yourself down on the ground, prostrate yourself on the ground and your forehead to the ground. And you are, there, there's something very powerful about that. There's something very powerful about humbling yourself physically, getting on your knees and putting your face to the ground. It's humbling. And you're really, you're really humbling yourself before God. That's the word for worship. I'll, I'll never forget one of the most, you know, just, I don't know what the word is, dearest, tierno, uh, special moments in my life. I was in... Uh, that we would send the girls off to school and I'd, you know, Michelle and I would each have our quiet time and we'd take turns taking care of Andrew. And I was in the, one of the girls' bedrooms and I was having my quiet time and I was sitting there on my knees with my forehead on the ground praying to God and I hear the door open and I, and I hear footsteps and I look over and there's Andrew on his knees with his face to the ground. He's just a little guy but he's just doing what I was doing. And I thought, you know, this is kind of weird, but he needs to see me humbling myself before God. He needs to see me worship God. He needs to understand what real worship is. I think our kids need to see us on our knees. Our families need to see us on our knees. We need to see each other on our knees, truly humbling ourselves before the Lord. And then of course, singing, that's a fun one. I don't think we sing enough. We should sing in the car. We should sing when we walk around. Some of us sing a lot, and that's great. But the cool thing about this is that you don't have to have a great voice. You know, we might not give you a mic, but you can sing in your car. You can sing at home. You can sing in the shower. 
And it's just good for our souls. The Bible tells us even to sing to each other. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I mean, we just, we should basically say, you know, that we should be living in a musical. You know, we should be singing a lot more. I think it's something we can grow a lot in. Uh, we don't do enough. So bottom line is this, uh, you know, our spirituality as leaders is just incredibly important. Everything depends on it. It's the one area of your life you want to make sure you excel in. Everything else will be fine. Everything else will line up properly. Our spirituality, that's our treasure. That's our gold. That's, that's, that's the pearl. That's the diamond. That we, that we are walking with God. That we're walking in the kingdom of God. The truth is God is more concerned about our hearts than even our actions. We will be judged by our actions. But we will be judged and pass judgment because of what's in our hearts. Because our actions come from our hearts. Our hearts are the, the, the wellspring of our lives. And we have to guard them and fill them up with the Spirit of God. And learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. Learn to listen to God. Learn to be empowered by God. Learn not to depend on ourselves, but to depend, to depend on Him. That's the power of great leadership. It's unique. It's amazing. It's exciting. It's a blast. There's, what I love about leadership is when I just see God's hand moving. When, we, when I stepped into the role, and Michelle and I stepped into the role of leading Hope Worldwide, there were so many problems. We were just flooded by problems and challenges and things that weren't going well. And we just prayed. We prayed a lot. And I honestly, the, the first year was just miracle after miracle after miracle. And we saw God's hand turning things around. It was like some movie where flowers were popping up out of the ground. It was springtime and God was blessing it. And all kinds of things, wonderful things were happening. And, and people would say, well, how do you do this? What are you doing? It's, it's, it's God. It really is. I'm not just trying to be ultra spiritual. It is God. The only thing I, I have figured out, the key to my success, is I know that anything I attach to God, anybody I get connected to God, is going to do much better. And that's the secret of life. That's the secret of the kingdom. That's the power of God. So thank you so much. You know, um, we're going to get to the pillars of the ministry. I'm, I'm not going to go into that today. But I will say this, that what makes a church successful, there's four main pillars. And that's another class. Faith, love, labor, and love. Faith, love, labor, and love. Actually, it's supposed to be uh, faith, love, labor, and sacrifice. Sorry. Um, those pillars are all spiritual things. And they happen spiritually by spiritual leadership. That's why the old saying, as go the people, as go the leader, so goes the people. It's true. As much as we try to go around it, it is true. Good leadership connects people to God and great things happen. Bad leadership connects people to themselves and not much happens. So how we live our life is incredibly important. So that concludes the spiritual leadership class. Thank you for listening. I'm going to send some material and some homework uh, on Saturday as we watch the class or whenever we're able to watch the class. Uh, thank you for your attention and thank you for listening and we'll see you at the next class. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.